Avantika Srinivasan and RJ Foster, welcome to Tokyo Theatre Friends. I'm very happy to be talking to the two of you today. You are starring in this like updated, like uh, Candida remix, I would call it. So would you like to tell our viewers and our listeners what this Candida has that others uh, haven't in the past? Well, I would say it's updated, updated into the 1920s, uh, based in Harlem. Usually, the show, the play, is in the 1880s, 1890s in England. So it kind of adds on a different sort of diverse cast of different ethnic groups that you know get to populate the play now, and it definitely decon it decontextualizes the material of the play into a sort of more mo vis visual and more modern uh, sort of uh, landscape than what it usually is done in, in terms of it being uh, English, all white and, and the 1880s, 1890s. Yeah, I think that um, the opportunity to, you know, and it's sort of, uh, it's represented a lot in the set, especially of, of these people are well-traveled, you know, They've settled in Harlem in 1920s, but you can see artifacts from really sort of around the world. Um, and that allows them to, to just bring a new perspective on, on life without it being just sort of pigeonholed in one, um, one city. They've moved, they've moved to Harlem um, and the Harlem Renaissance and the cultural um, sort of new awakening that was happening during that time is all sort of, we're all part of the discussions of, of this play. And you play a married couple. So I wonder, you know, have you had, have you had to talk about, like, have you given a backstory to how the Reverend Morel and Candy met? Like, have you thought up this life before we meet them at the start of the play? Well, I've always thought that I, uh, you know, my family's from India and I'm first generation perhaps and uh, I grew up in New Jersey and somehow met the Reverend uh, working for him, being a secretary. And that's sort of how we met of, um, you know, falling really in love with the work, but also his charisma, the way he speaks, the way he delivers the sermons and how ambitious he is and how motivated he is. And I think that working relationship um, then turned into a romantic one. Um, but as for my heritage, I think that I, you know, my, my parents must have moved here from India in the late 1800s, perhaps. Um, and yeah, and, and made a life in, in the U.S. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, I, that's basically the main idea of backstory you can think of and how that actually pl uh, applies to aspects of what's happening in their marriage now and the complications that arise from it. It kind of deals with the idea of being too comfortable in a relationship and too taking things for granted. And when you have met someone for a long time, you work with them, you know them inside and out. Um, a lot of times you take loved ones for advantage. You still love them, but you get in sort of rhythm of life, a rhythm of doing things, and you kind of forget of the attention that is needed on a relationship. And so that's sort of long-term sort of knowing each other as coworkers, friends, lovers, married couple, parents, uh, that happens with everybody. And I think the play, deals with that in that sort of way. One of the most exciting things about the Reverend is how freaking charming he is. And at some point, another character even goes something like, hey, like you're starting to sound like an actor, like you're performing. So did the two of you grow up in religious households? And if so, were there any element about attending service or any element surrounding religion that led you to become artists and led you to want to be on stage performing like the Reverend? I would say I grew up um, Catholic slash Baptist. So my mother was Catholic, 
but she converted to be Catholic. But we had to go to my grandmother's church. So we had like an hour and a half sermon, you know, for like three weeks. And then one week it'd be five hours, you know. So I got the taste of both. <laughs> and the interesting thing, how that kind of helped with me with Morel was, you know, kid, as a kid, you see priests and, you know, deacons and, you know, and you think of them though, those are holy adult people and you take, but you also go, well, that guy's better at this than that guy. <laughs> you know, that guy's charming. And you definitely, you go like, oh, we're having Deacon Adams today. Mm, okay, fine. You know what the sermon's going to be like. <laughs> you have Father Sterling. Oh, it's going to be a show. It's going to be, he's going to tell some jokes. You know, it's, we're going to get in and out pretty quickly. Uh, he also has something to say. Um, so that's, so you do have a sort of idea of, yes, they're all holy men and they're all doing it, but there is a show. And I was, I was an altar boy for a little bit um, uh, when I was younger. Uh, I wanted to do it and then eventually I got, I don't want to keep doing this anymore. <laughs> I got kind of uh, uh, bored with it. But there is a sort of like uh, theater in, in the Catholic church. You know, there is a sort of like ceremony to it and you get on the altar and the stage and you do your part and you hold this and, and you're like, basically when you altar serve, you're glorified extra in a weird way to like the main star that's the priest but you do uh you do get a sense of theatricality from doing it so that's if that's any sort of answer to your question yeah yeah i indian temples are a bit different because when you go there it's it's not really a, a anyone giving a sermon per se it's sort of just you, there's chanting this there's pujas, there's things, rituals that happen at the temple. So it's not like one person is, you know, perhaps maybe getting up and speaking. But that being said, you know, there are other, um, there are other moments, uh, events called satsangs that you have like a guru or uh, like a spiritual person who might gather at somebody's house for an evening and talk about a particular topic, you know, and that might be, you know, one day it might be about karma. One might, might one night it might be about reincarnation. So like taking a very focused topic and then just having a discussion and sort of, um, yeah, uh, talking about it with people and people can come watch. And I remember going to a bunch of these with my friends when I was younger, being made to go really by my parents. And I guess, you know, we would we would sit there and, and think about what guru, what guruji is fun and re makes it relatable to children, you know, these highly elevated topics of karma and reincarnation as a as a 12 year old, I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about any of these. Can I go back and play my video games? Thanks. You know, but yeah, there would be people who would try to make it more fun and more relevant to a teenager and other people who would just kind of like give it to you straight, super monotone and you hope you get it or hope you don't. So um, I think all of those things of, of just not only um, thinking about the techniques of an actor and the charisma and presenting on stage and all of that and the performance of it, but it also makes me think of relating to your audience, you know, and how do you authentically connect with whoever they are, you know? And of course, as an actor, we're not gonna be sitting there every night being like, I wonder who's in the audience, I, I wonder who's watching. But I think it, 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 it speaks to a bigger perspective of, of who is our audience today coming to the theater and how does this play relate to them in real time? Um, and would it still be relevant if we said it in 18 whatever in England versus Harlem 1920s and and those kinds of questions also come up for me um, yeah there was a uh, another story about being an altar boy so I wanted to do it when I was a kid and eventually I was like I, I don't want to do this anymore I told my mom in the car after church one day she got um, upset with me she was like that this is your calling this is your calling and I was and I sat there going like no it's not I just something I thought was fun but 
but it actually kind of stuck with me in a weird way to this day about even though she wasn't right about being an altar boy was my calling i think she was more like embarrassed about me quitting and what the priest would say but um but it did stick with me in the sense of being a performer being an artist being an actor you know giving working in the arts the idea of it being a calling not something you just do as a job you know the there's a lot of things you could do <laughs> for more stability in terms of employment uh so the idea of it, it's it's important work and whatever that means to you is is your own business but the idea of it being a calling that it's a thing that you have to do it's not something that you should do in, in, in a lot of cases but it's a thing that you have to do when you have a responsibility towards it and to other people. So if that's that's another aspect that plays into my life about religion and, and theater and acting, I guess. Mm. Yeah. And yet acting and performing is, it's definitely a calling, but it's also very hard to maintain. And I don't think I've ever met any artist who's ever not doubted like, can I just do something else? This is so hard to do. So how do the two of you, you know, keep up answering that that call? Like, why are you performers? Why do you keep being artists, given everything that's happening all over the world and in, in the arts as well? Do you have six hours? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's... I, I found theater and acting in a very, very interesting and peculiar way. You know, I, I did not start as an actor. I was a chemistry major. I was a scientist. I was a science nerd all through high school and college. And it was only halfway through college that I realized that's not med school, you know, is not it's not, it's not the journey that I want to be on and took a lot of time to soul search and well, convince my parents too that, you know, an Indian kid going to be an actor. That was a, a very big no-no, you know? Um, but I think the the reason I did it and still do it and will continue to is, is, is discovering, getting to discover who, who I am authentically, you know, my strengths, my flaws and understanding, getting to understand that truly and um, every night on stage, hopefully allowing the audience to connect with a little bit of humanity and the human condition, even if it's just for a split second, you know, getting to feel things that they might not usually feel on a day to day basis. And I think as actors, we have such an immense responsibility to to do that for people every night show up as authentically as we can be vulnerable on stage um respond to the moment really just live in the moment and 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 see what that does to a fourth grade boy who has never seen theater before and has completely now his life has changed i mean that doesn't happen every night but but it's thought provoking something does happen with audiences every single night and I think that is the magic of being an actor, whether it's theater or TV film or whatever, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain degree of selfishly, I, it's the only thing that I was ever good at <laughs> or kept at doing. I mean, that's just kind of that's kind of the truth. It was the only thing that- I That's not at. true, RJ. You didn't know me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I mean like, or, or, I, I dedicated myself to and it what didn't feel like work that I could put long hours into it and didn't mind the grind didn't mind wanting to get better it was something that I was like oh I, I like this and I want to be better at it and in the idea of affecting other people is a very important part of it I mean there are a lot of times when you do a show you kind of care about you know what other, what other people in your line of work think what other actors directors you know, reviews, that sort of thing. You, you do think about that. If anyone who says that they don't is lying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> true. I mean, you do care about what your reputation is, but 
I will say the things that have always stuck with me is, is after a show or someone who isn't an actor or a performer or, you know, is really moved by a show or really liked what you did or, you know, and, and really talks to you about it, like tells their own personal story. I've had that a few times. And, it's, and I've always remembered that more than anything else that I've done in my career, it's, it's been people who, you know, work, you know, nine to five jobs and we're like, oh, this really made me think. And it really does struck you because you did something for somebody. I mean, I think we can get, I'd say cynical, but when you're in this sort of business or in this line of work, you see a lot of things, you see a lot of shows and you kind of look at shows in a different way than a general audience does sometimes. You kind of mm -hmm. look like, oh, that seems like it was hard to work on or uh, this seems boring or oh, the direction here was, you know, you, you don't you think of it in different ways sometimes. And you kind of forget that you're doing this for people, <laughs> that you're doing it to move everybody. You're doing it for people to actually think about their lives, think about um, how they go, how they think about the world. And when that hits you, it, it really is a fulfilling sort of moment in a lot of ways, because you go, oh, if I did one thing, I did change that person's life in one, for a little bit, you know, not saying you change their life and, you know, they're going to become, you know, Buddha or something, you know, you, you change, <laughs> you change it just a little bit of that, oh, I, I did something that made people think differently or think about themselves different or made them happy or made them deal with emotions that they weren't dealing with before. And if you can do that, it's better than them falling asleep. <laughs> you know, it's better than them not caring at all. And, and it's a profound thing to do. I mean, it really is. You, we take it for granted, I think, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, we do the show, then go home. and But it is a heavy responsibility. And I think it's, a, it's a, again, a calling. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, you don't know for sure if someone who saw you in Pat, Pat Han, for instance, won't become the Buddha, you know, like maybe they might. Yeah. So I were there any moments for you know each of you where someone or something, a piece of art or seeing someone perform or song or any you know art uh work that you want to mention did that for you where you went, okay, holy shit, there's something here that I wasn't expecting. Like something struck you like lightning in a good way. I don't know if it's one thing for me. I don't know that it's a show or it's a moment. Uh, I've seen lots of really good theater. I've, uh, and some of the early theaters that I saw, pieces of theater that I saw was Guard de the Taj at the Atlantic with um, Omar Metwali and Ariane Moad. I mean, I, that changed my life truly. Um, getting to see the humans on Broadway uh, or when it was, it was maybe off Broadway uh, first that changed my life. Um, but more than that, I think it was just you know in college, I think it was sophomore year. Um, my intro was French theater, French classical theater, and and just being reading Moliere plays and Corneille plays and getting to do them and and um, that that truly in the rehearsal process and being in tech. Tech often is, I think, one of actors like most hated times of rehearsal sometimes. But for me, it's my most favorite. I absolutely love tech, you know? Um, so I think it's like an amalgamation of seeing those pieces of Phantom of the Opera also. I, the first time I ever saw a big show like that on Broadway, I was like, oh my God, that is cool. That's just the, just the, the production value and the, the the skill set that is involved in performing that, um, just all of that coming together, I was like, "There's got to be, there's got to be something in this. I want to, I want to explore um, this, this, this new thing here." I remember I was a little kid, and my dad got tickets to the Ford Theater in Washington from work. Like he got free tickets. I don't know what for, but he got free tickets to see this show in DC and the show, I tried to look it up online. I don't know, it, as if it never existed, but it was called Kudzu. It was some musical called Kudzu. 
And I think it was based off of some comic strip. I'm pretty sure it's not very good. I mean, I've never, it's like, I tried, I was like, I know I didn't dream this. I know I went and saw this play when I was a kid. And, and at the time I, I, I was just amazed by it. It is not something I would do now. I'm not a big musical person, but it was something about seeing people, the first time seeing a play and seeing people do that. And that definitely did spark something. And I didn't want to be an actor then, but something about that was like, oh, what are they doing? It's, it's this amazing thing of pretending to be other people. And, and then as I got older and you know went to high school and started doing theater here and there and teachers encouraging me to do it, it was, just got into it and just deep dived into it and 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 just and just finding that it was like I, I kind of agree with the tech thing actually too like uh the idea of like you have this intense sort of relationship with people for a, a small period of time I, I thought about this in high school a lot too this really intense sort of relationship where you're trying to create something and then I always not say I like but I always find it interesting going into a theater after you did something and they take the set down and it's like oh it's totally gone yeah it's just it's gone it's just you know and and that idea of like for a brief period of time you created something for people and then it goes away it just it's done and I always I was always amazed by that in high school doing plays that that you did all this stuff and it seemed like the most intense important thing of doing you know some play you know I don't know, you know, and for your parents and <laughs> the students and and thinking it was the most important thing in the world and then all of a sudden last night you go back to the auditorium and the whole thing's gone and you go like oh we did something and now it's lost the time and hopefully whatever embers of that may you know stick around with somebody you know it's it's, it's that sort of that's what always intrigued me about theater uh, 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 when I was young and it kind of let me and then getting to know people, different types of people, working with different types of people, things clashing, things coming together. It's a, it's a great amalgamation of, of a work environment. So right now, as the two of you are coexisting, I would have been like, it's almost like the Reverend and Candy are your roommates in a way for a while. Do you have a process to let go of those characters that you won't be playing anymore? Like, do you have a process of grieving if at all or do you simply go you know like i'm just gonna put you in the star and it was great being with you and maybe we'll see each other sometime in the future again that used to be that that, that happened to me a lot that when i was younger and then all of a sudden i kind of lost that i don't know why like it was like very much i've, I've gotten the point now show's over mm. <laughs> you know i mean I, it, it's it's a weird thing i don't like to admit it but it's kind of true it's like you know, there, there will be sometimes after doing a show where I'll just say lines from the show randomly, <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, I'll do that. But for the most part, like the sort of, I used to go through, uh, not say depression, but a sort of like, oh, yeah. what did I do with my day? And like, I, I, I miss my old friend who I used to play, you know? And then as I got older, it's, <laughs> I will say I've gotten to the point where, oh, closely night. Oh, there we go. What's the next thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's the next audition? Let's go. Yeah, yeah it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of like that to a right. certain degree. Right. right. I, I would say that it depends for me. I mean, I think that I've absolutely struggled with letting go of some characters. Um, there was a character that I played in drama school called um, Laurencia from Fuente Ovahuna, the play. I mean, she's gang raped she's it's a very intense play it's a very uh, moving play and that took me weeks for me to sort of let go of her um and there are other characters that are just really moving really speak to my own culture in a very deep and beautiful way and and sort of really just like vibrate you know in a way within myself when i was doing it that i was like oh my god i i i can i can absolutely relate to what this girl might have been going through and those and those characters i know will stick with me forever you know and then there's others that 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 they're pleasure to play and they're wonderful but it's just easier that transition is easier to get out of them but Regardless of the character, I think post-show blues for me are real. And I've come to really, um, 
like I, I don't know I I I I've needed to I, I make it a point to do something really fun you know post closing like the first two three days um, whether it's just a, a massage or it's a mani pedi or if it's a little weekend getaway somewhere um, just to just to because I know that it's gonna be weird it's a every day when I walk to the theater I'm like this is a privilege to be an actor in New York it is an absolute privilege regardless of whether or not you like the show, you like the character, whatever. And so when that's not there, I realized that, wow, there are people who would kill to do this and I'm doing this and now I'm not. And sure, I will again, but it's always a, it's always a, a I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of a sucky thing to, to close a show. Well, I, I've had times where like, I've played Othello uh, twice before. <laughs> And each time I was like, I'm done. You know, it's, it, it, it's like, I, I, you really, it's, it's also, you in, so intensely do it. And it, it brings you through the ringer that eventually you come out at the other end fulfilled in certain ways. But it, it, if you're doing it really committedly and you really do care about what you're doing, there are times where you're like, I'm, I've appreciated this, but I just, this is, you know, and there's somewhere you go, like, this was fun to do. I'll miss all the people. And I kind of miss, you know, doing this character and this journey. But I do like, for, yeah, for example, like Othello, I was like, I did it twice. And last, each time I was like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> like, I don't want to go through that anymore. It just, you know, in, in, not in a negative way per se, you know, but it just like, it can be very taxing after a while. And you're proud of it and you like the work, but there are times where you go, I did my job, and mm -hmm. uh, what's the next one? <laughs> That's just, uh, just me, I guess. But. Yeah. Since 2020 and since the pandemic and since you know the the arts and theater specifically went through this very violent, very sudden change, there's been this conversation, this dialogue around whether people should be doing more classics or whether people should just be pursuing new work. So. Obviously, the classics are classics for a reason, and I don't think anyone's ever going to stop doing them. But for the two of you, what did you find in your characters that spoke about today that made you go, I have to do this play? Like, I simply cannot not play this part. For me, it's the fact that Canada is speaking her mind. You know, she truly has a choice whether or not she wants to leave her husband, go away with this poet or go away by herself, whatever it is, you know, and um, this, this idea of new woman and, and uh, standing up for herself and realizing the, um, you know, she starts, she, she, in the beginning of the play, she comes in, she's dissatisfied with her life. She doesn't know what's up, you know? She's not getting the, uh, the attention she, she wants from her husband. This, this, this young poet has come, come in to their home and showering her with this adoration, this, 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 this attention, and she's loving it. Something's off, you know? And that journey from that to realizing that the true power lies in herself, the fact that she truly has made morale and her life what it is today and his career that newfound power and ownership that she takes of her life i think i mean speaks to women regardless of what time period they're in you know finding their own voices and for me personally those questions have arised constantly over the past several years you know, so I think um, realizing that and getting to be able to voice that out loud. Um, I, I, when I read the play, I was like, yeah, this is let's talk about a strong female lead, strong woman. Um, wanted me to do it for sure. Um, for me, it was the idea of speaking about today's world is morale feels like he's certain about life 
has his own sort of political views. He feels that his marriage and how he's going and his household is correct. And it's, there's nothing wrong until this young poet comes in. And, and speaking of relating that in sort of today's sort of reality, I think a lot of us are morales in many ways and that we all think we're certain about stuff. Like we all have our, this is how I'm either this sort of, I don't know, political party or I have this sort of belief in whatever. And, and to me, the lesson of the play is to be present, to be truly present, to actually look at what's around you and, and not be, not have blinders on about what's in front of you. Like literally uh, look at the world openly and what do you contribute to it? And what can the world give to you as well? And, and that's to me the major lesson with Morel. Cause I, I kind of find in today's world, you've talked about whether we should do classics or new plays. I always find discussions like that to be a little besides the point. It should be, what's the best work for right now? You know, you know it's like, it's, it, it could be a classic play. It could be a new play. We, you, that's kind of the fun of doing this. <laughs> you know, so you, you never know. That's, you know, that's the sort of rolling the dice of working in the theater, working in the arts. And so it could, you know, the answers to our problems may be an old play, or maybe it has to be someone right now that needs to figure this out. And we just don't know. And that's how I kind of feel about Morel is Morel thinks that he's a socialist preacher. He has this wife who loves him and as everything's right, he goes out and people love him for doing it. He gets, you know, validation from it. So he doesn't recognize that his marriage isn't what it was. His politics may not be as uh, sound as he may think they are. You know, there's so many things that he needs to start questioning. And I think we all need to question ourselves, no matter how uh, virtuous or right or well intentioned you may be, you should always question yourself for the betterment of others. And I think uh, what uh, Marchbanks, the poet, spurs in uh, Morel is to question, what is the meaning of love? What is the meaning of this relationship with his wife? What is the meaning of what he does for a living? Uh, who is he? And that doesn't mean he should change, you know, you know, be, you know, that he should change uh, uh, wholeheartedly, quit his job. But it's how do you approach your marriage? How do you approach what you do for a living? How do you approach how you interact with the world? And I think that's one of the main things that drew me to the character a lot was that sort of aspect of him. I don't want to be, I don't want to sound like too didactic or anything, but uh, do you ever end up then being taught by the characters that you're playing? Like when you enter them and you're like, okay, yeah, I know how to do this. And then you realize that the character in a way was like a Yoda figure for you, like mm -hmm. something that you needed in the moment in your life. In a way, yeah, like even for this play, um, I've been very uh, busy the past year and a half. I've been out of town and, you know, do, and I'm married and I have a kid. And so that sort of balancing act of, uh, of being attentive to your family, but also, you know, making money and being professional, you know, and how do you balance that? And, and this play kind of hits home for me in that sort of aspect of, you know, they, they call it, was it in corporate life, you know, work-life balance, so, you know, it is, it is that, you know, and, it, and it's taught me in many ways about how to approach my own life when it comes to how much time should I be attentive? Oh, I can't be on the phone. I should be with my kid. You know, like that sort of thing. Oh, I should go, we should have date night with my wife. You know, there's these little aspects that the show is even teaching me uh, in my day-to-day -day life, just in that sort of sense. Yeah. I mean, I would say that a couple of things, I guess. The one would be, you know, Canada um, lets herself handle everything with grace, you know? And she lets herself be amused by a lot of things, and and leads, I think, goes through life with a lot of empathy, and uh, until until things are not funny anymore, you know. But but she does have a lot of a lot of love to give, and so I think that I'm trying to take that to my life too, of of how can I let the world amuse me, you know, 
and and not take things so seriously all the time. Um, but then also, uh, yeah, this idea of of where does my strength live, right? I, talking about authentic self, um, who am I truly? And these are questions that are not easy to answer, and 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 I think we all struggle with it all the time. But thinking about, yeah, what is um what is my voice? When do I stand up for myself? When do I um, what are the battles that I do choose to fight? Um, so I guess are just some of the bigger, bigger life questions that this play is definitely forcing me to ask. And with that, I would say that's a perfect way to wrap up, leaving people with those questions. So thank you both for joining me today. Would you like to invite our viewers and our listeners to go see uh, the show? Yes, absolutely. Yes, come see the show. We are at Theater Row. That's 42nd Street and 9th Avenue. Um, and uh, we run through November 19th. And um, so we're still in previews. We open on October 25th. And yeah, there's still there's still about a month and five days to come watch us. So so come by and, and we promise it'll be a good time. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Break a Leg, and have fun on stage. It was thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Zay.